Hey everyone. In today's session, I'm going to cover how we built a consistent hash ring for gRPC uh, while we were implementing SpiceDB. Um, before we jump into that, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on who I am um, and where I've been, what I've done, um, just to build some credibility. Um, so it makes better sense, kind of the context under which uh, we went about to solve this problem and build this library. Um, so my name is Jimmy Zelensky. I'm the co-founder and uh, one of the creators of SpiceDB, which is built uh, by a company called OpZ. Um, I'm going to get into SpiceDB a little bit later because it's going to be a core part of the story of kind of why we built this library and how it fits in um, to our application and how it might fit into your applications as well. Um, but prior to all of this, I worked at a company called Red Hat um, by way of the CoreOS acquisition. Um, at Red Hat, I was a product manager and also an SRE. Um, and then uh, I built basically uh, the largest service that was running at Red Hat um, while I was at CoreOS. You might know uh, that in the ecosystem. It's called Quaida IO. Um, and uh, effectively, uh, I've worked as a software engineer um, and a product manager, <clears throat> always carrying a pager, always kind of working on distributed systems. Um, in the ecosystem, uh, the greater open source community, um, I'm an OCI maintainer. So that is the standards body for containers, um, if you're unfamiliar. And then I've also created a couple of the kind of CNCF landscape projects. Um, notably, uh, operator framework is one of the ones that we started at CoreOS and got inherited by Red Hat and eventually incubated by CNCF. Um, but I've worked on a whole bunch of other things in the space too. And uh, I've kind of been around uh, since before the CNCF was founded. Um, I started working at CoreOS in 2014 and CNCF and Kubernetes kind of started around 2015. So been around, familiar with containers, conf uh, familiar with kind of cloud native ecosystems and building um, things on the cloud with or without Kubernetes in a cloud native fashion. Um, I've got some contact info here. Uh, feel free to like come back to the slide whenever. Um, I prefer folks reach out to me by email. Um, doesn't matter what the, the question is. Uh, I'm willing to spend time with anyone answering any questions, uh, guide you to the right place. Um, email is the best way if you want to reach me for that. Um, it's asynchronous, but you can also find me on GitHub or Twitter. Um, but then also if you want to actually like ping me synchronously and have a, a real-time conversation, you can also find me in the SpiceDB Discord uh, under the username jzelinski. Speaking of SpiceDB, um, what exactly is SpiceDB? It's going to be critical to kind of understand uh, the rest of this talk. Um, <clears throat> SpiceDB is actually a framework for kind of building secure modern authorization systems. Um, so fundamentally, folks, they get product requirements in their application, usually when they get um, their first big enterprise customer, and that functionality uh, usually is dictating um, some kind of hierarchy around permissions uh, and access to data stored within the system. So they might require that, for example, there's a higher level concept called like an organization, and organizations can have teams, and then uh, within a team, there might be roles, and then uh, users are assigned to roles. Um, this is kind of like a typical kind of hierarchy that you'd see. A lot of people will call the system I just described RBAC, um, but there's a lot of subtle details as to how different applications um, implement RBAC in different ways and what those requirements are. And because all those things can vary greatly, um, the recommendation from security professionals is that you actually build on top of a pre-existing um, authorization tool chain um, to actually build out these systems because uh, if you build them yourselves, you're very likely to introduce security flaws um, or make changes that um, fundamentally um, limit the capabilities of your product and make it so you can't implement uh, features that uh, your customers are gonna require in the future. Um, ask me how I know. I've experienced all of these pain problems, which is why um, we left to start our own company, uh, Offset, to build SpiceDB. Um, so why is SpiceDB different from your homegrown system? Um, so it is actually inspired by the technology um, built at Google called Zanzibar. Um, and this is, uh, SpiceDB is the most mature open source implementation of that. Um, it's being used in production um, for a couple of years now by um, companies large and small. Um, so we've kind of tested it in the full gamut, um, but the real core power to it is kind of all around um, its design with regards to uh, relational uh, relationship-based access control. So Reback, which is not to be confused with RBAC, is actually a, a kind of lower level design where a chain of relationships 
defines whether or not a person has access. Um, so this actually first got started um, by Facebook. Um, they started protecting their social network using basically graphs um, uh, because Facebook's database fundamentally is a graph. It was a very natural fit. But uh, ultimately what Google found um, was that even applications where the core data is not a graph, um, it benefited from modeling at least the authorization system as a graph um, to make that a separate and more understandable system. And what's even uh, cooler about all this is that actually, um, because you're modeling a subset of your data as a graph, um, the, the graph system actually runs as a separate system entirely. Um, so that would be SpiceDB in this case, and your applications would call then into SpiceDB and ask questions such as, um, can this user access this document? Um, that's really powerful because um, now you don't actually have any of that logic living within your applications, and any application can make those queries at any point in time in the lifecycle of handling uh, requests for, or user interactions. Um, so that means you don't have to know explicitly ahead of time um, what things need to be, what permissions need to be checked to handle a request. Instead, you can let any application check um, the request as needed, check the permissions as needed to handle a request at any point in time. Um, while the system is being processed in something like a uh, microservice architecture. Um, so I said earlier that SpiceDB is a permissions database. Uh, so that means that you write a schema and the schema kind of models the objects in the system and the relationships across them. And then you're gonna write data into the database um, that has that schema applied and then you can query that data in an efficient way to answer these permission questions. So on the left, I've got an example of schema. Um, this is basically modeling a very simple uh, system that kind of looks like Google Docs. Um, so there's going to be documents and then there's going to be kind of roles that you can assign to each individual document. You can be a reader of a document, you can be a writer of a document, and there are permissions on that document. So just like, can you edit or can you view this document? Um, if you look at uh, the very bottom where we have the view permission, you'll see that the view permission is actually defined as um, being both the reader and the writer. Um, and you can actually then see uh, on the right hand side, if someone does a permission check, this is using Z, which is the official command line tool for SpiceDB. Um, this lets you query SpiceDB from your command line and just check on data and um, truly understand kind of the flows through the system, um, and as well as timing information um, and debugging uh, metadata. So um, in this example, we've done that check and you'll see that first, um, evaluates to true. So Fred does have access um, and we'll even explain why. It will show that first it checked the writer um, set of users and it did not find Fred, but then it checked the reader set of users and it did find Fred. So Fred was uh, granted access by means of being a reader to the system. Cool. Um, now we have kind of a basic understanding of SpiceDB. But what's really important is kind of this nested behavior. There's a reason why this is uh, this debug information is kind of being displayed as a tree. Um, and that's because you can actually break down the request, that uh, check request, checking if Fred has access to first doc. Um, and you can actually do a bunch of this in parallel. So fundamentally how SpiceDB works is it breaks down the requests onto sub requests, evaluates them in parallel, um, and it wants to try to cache those values as much as possible because um, authorization and checking permissions is in the critical path of absolutely everything you're gonna be doing within your, your systems. Um, so for example, a request comes in from your API, um, the first thing it's gonna do um, is check to see if the user has access to be able to perform that action that they're trying to perform before your application does any other work. So that means that we're targeting in the, the few milliseconds for response times from SpiceDB. Um, fundamentally, that means that almost everything needs to already have been pre-computed and in cache. Um, so we wanna serve everything from memory uh, as much as possible. Um, so uh, fundamentally, the, the solution to us getting all the stuff served that quickly is to have a sophisticated distributed caching system. So not only is SpiceDB kind of this recursive and uh, parallel graph uh, engine, it also has a sophisticated distributing caching mechanism built throughout the whole system. Um, if you're familiar kind of with caching in a regular application architecture, what normally happens is you have requests flowing into the system. 
um, they get randomly assigned to a server, uh, an instance in this case, they're the circles. Um, each of those servers have their own independent cache in memory. And then uh, if the value that the application is looking for is not in that cache, it then reaches back out to storage, which is probably a database system um, to, to actually compute that result. And then it returns that, probably inserts it into its cache. Um, this is pretty standard in web applications from a caching, often storage is, is Redis. Um, so distributed caching adds these additional arrows to that whole system, um, which is uh, kind of this bidirectionality between the caches in uh, the set of uh, applications themselves. So that means that they actually are aware of each other um, and know what values are actually in each other's cache so that they don't have to reach out to storage, they can reach out to their neighbor's cache and get that value straight from memory. Um, you might be thinking, hey, like, what's the difference between the hop to the storage versus a hop to my neighbor to reach into the cache? Um, while you are paying the same network latency, querying the database um, is likely going to be more um, overhead. It's probably going to be doing way more computation. Um, and it's almost certainly not going to just read directly from memory from already pre-computed result. The more expensive the computation you need to do on the data store um, in the storage system uh, to get that result, uh, the more the cache is going to be saving you from, from that work. So it is usually worth uh, making an extra hop to your neighbor, even if um, you are making that, that network latency. All right, so now that we kind of understand the SpiceDB use case, um, it's time to dive into what a consistent hash ring is. Um, but before we answer that question, uh, we have to answer the question, what is consistent hashing? So um, <clears throat> consistent hashing is a concept that was kind of mostly researched in the 90s. Um, at the time, it didn't really have a name. Um, nowadays, a lot of folks are familiar with this because it's so ubiquitously used in distributed systems. The idea is that you're going to map a key um, to a finite set of nodes. Um, you're going to do that using a hashing algorithm. So if you take something like uh, three values, foo, bar, and baz, and you run them through a hash algorithm, they're going to evaluate to a number. Um, and that number is then going to map itself to uh, a set of nodes. Um, the most simple uh, hash algorithm you can use is modulus. Um, so you can say uh, like mod, mod three in this case. Um, is, is the example being used here. And that means when you go to run foo, uh, and you do mod three, it gets evaluated to one. Every single time you run foo through that hashed algorithm, it needs to evaluate to that same value. Um, this is gonna be the core between picking which nodes we're going to route um, to and which nodes should hold the value in memory in their cache. Um, this is kind of like the first stab at the research. You'll see that who and Baz are both getting uh, mapped to node number one, and then Bar is getting mapped to node number three. But where this really falls over is um, in, a, in a, a problem called rebalancing. And so what rebalancing uh, is meant to deal with is basically what happens when one of these nodes go missing. So uh, in this example, I made it so that node one goes missing, but also there are other events such as adding more nodes to the system um, that would incur a rebalancing. Um, to try to fix all these things. The, the problem here is that if we remove um, node one and we only have node two and three, um, we're still going to get values if we do modulus three as our hash function that map to node one. Foo and Baz fundamentally have to go to node one, but node one is gone. So now we've effectively lost this data if we're using this to store data. Um, we won't get an answer to this uh, problem until basically a algorithm called rendezvous. Um, and that was written in a paper in 1996. Uh, but I'm actually not so interested in rendezvous so much as um, a paper published the following year in 97, um, which is where we get uh, consistent hash rings introduced. Um, and uh, while not the first solution um, to this problem, it has become the lasting solution to this problem. Um, the idea behind a consistent hash ring is actually that um, you have basically this array and the array uh, wraps around at the end. So if you uh, iterate past the last value in the array, you arrive back at the first. Um, the way that folks like to um, kind of uh, visualize arrays that work this way, um, typically call them something like a ring buffer. Um, they put them as a circle, kind of similar to a wall clock like I've, I've drawn here. Um, 
And then what happens is we have uh, nodes one, two, and three mapped as effectively times on the clock. Um, but you'll notice there's a whole bunch of these other lines here. Um, <clears throat> and those are all the possible values um, that can get hashed to. Um, so when we, we run a hash on foo, bar, and buzz, they get mapped to one of these individual lines and not actually specifically to node number one, node number two, or node number three. Um, <clears throat> the idea now is that we kind of round those values to the nearest node. Um, so we kind of move clockwise um, and kind of arrive at the, at the um, node that is real, basically, um, in, in the ring. So now uh, you can see that foo and bars, they both get mapped to node one, just like in the previous example, and then bar gets mapped to node number three, just like the previous example. But we've got this additional metadata now, this data of kind of the location on the clock. <clears throat> So now when we get a rebalancing event, such as node number four being introduced in between foo and baz, um, you can see if foo now points to node number four, baz still points to node number one. So that means we only have to update um, foo from pointing uh, to node number one, from node number one to node number four. Um, so we've kind of like minimized the damage. A bunch of the, the keys will not have to be changed at all um, when this, this gets introduced. Um, and so we, we now have this guarantee of um, kind of how much work has to be done when a node is added or removed. Um, now, uh, you may be thinking, looking at this example, wow, that's like a really bad distribution. Um, look where node number four and node number one are really close together. How can you make guarantees about the closeness of these things to kind of minimize the disruption? And so what you do in practice is you create what are called virtual nodes. So you would actually um, say we had kind of these four nodes here. What you would actually do in practice is probably have something like a thousand of those nodes um, and they virtually exist. And those virtual nodes would then map to real physical nodes that exist in the system. Um, and that kind of keeps the, the balancing to uh, a minimum amount um, when you need to add or remove nodes uh, and there is disruption. It also lets you do a really interesting thing, which is configure replication. So say um, <clears throat> we didn't want to lose data when one of these nodes um, ceased to exist. What we could do is actually um, modify kind of how we store things in this ring. We could say that once something is mapped, for example, foo is mapped to node four, we could then run another hash of foo combined with node four, for example, and that would map to yet another location on the ring, and we could store the data there as well, and that would be a replication factor of two. And then we could also, maybe if the replication factor was three, you could hash that again, and then find yet another location on the ring and save that data there. Um, and then that is a kind of configurable metric that you can have for resiliency for nodes coming and going out of a system such that you're not going to lose data when one particular node leaves. Um, so this is actually why um, the hash ring kind of algorithm has stuck around for a really long time. It has a lot of these properties um, <clears throat> that are um, kind of beneficial for configuring and um, dynamically adapting to the different requirements that folks have in applications. So. Um, we have an implementation of this, um, everything that was just described with the hash ring in Go, that is completely agnostic to the use case. Um, so you can uh, install this in your Go application and start using uh, the following API. Um, what makes it generic is actually you can plug in your own hash function. So you could literally use modulus, like I just used in the example, or you could um, use uh, basically um, very, very fast hashing algorithms um, that are not cryptographically secure, or you can use cryptographically secure hash algorithms that are um, expensive to compute without hardware acceleration, for example. Um, all of that's completely configurable, but we kind of have this basic API that always stays consistent across hash rings, um, which is one of adding and removing members, um, listing the members themselves, and then also finding um, kind of uh, the set of members from that list. Um, so. Uh, this is totally agnostic and can be adopted by, by anyone in any use case, as long as they're writing in Go. Um, but the whole topic of this conversation is actually gRPC and how this all fits into gRPC. So now that we've got this um, 
kind of agnostic and neutral implementation of the hash rate concepts, how do we map that back into gRPC world so we can actually um, kind of balance gRPC requests using this hash rate logic? So um, if we dig into uh, googlegoing.org slash gRPC slash balancer, this is a Go package um, that's used uh, as bread as the set of kind of official Golang gRPC um, packages. Um, we've got this interface balancer. Um, and if we look at the documentation, uh, we can look at all the kind of methods. The only method we really care about is this uh, update client state con method that I'm going to be showing in depth later. But um, if we go through the actual the, the doc comment, which is at the very bottom, you'll see that it says uh, balancer takes input from gRPC, manages subcons, and collects and aggregates connectivity states. Um, but it also generates and updates the picker used by gRPC to pick subcons for RPCs. So fundamentally, it sounds like we're going to have to do a bunch of bookkeeping that gRPC expects. That's that kind of first sentence. And then um, in the second sentence, it says, actually, this is going to be your hook for um, providing a picker implementation, which is going to pick how we're going to map a request to a particular connection. Great, so let's look at what a picker is. A picker has this one method pick, um, and that's the thing that's actually going to do the mapping, like you said. So fundamentally, what we need to do is implement a picker um, that is going to pull nodes out of our member list and select the right one from the hash ring and then send the request to that particular member. Fantastic. So let's start implementing the uh, update client con state method. Um, We've got a ring balancer uh, implementation here, and I kind of cut out uh, a lot of stuff. I'm just going to focus on basically implementing this one method. And I also cut out a lot of boilerplate, um, things like locking and, and things that are not necessarily tied to um, the hash rate logic in this. Um, you still have to implement a lot of the um, invariants that gRPC assumes when you hook into gRPC and implement balancer. So I don't really want to focus on, on much of that, although I will cover some of it. Um, just by happenstance, um, <clears throat> I really want to focus just on where uh, we're kind of doing updates to our hash ring within this implementation, um, because that's the, the novel and interesting part about uh, this library. So um, we, we get into this method. This method is going to be called whenever there's a change to the client state. So um, we're going to be handling a bunch of different conditions uh, that are going to occur to connections. Um, the first of all, like the first one we're ever going to check is that um, the service config has changed. Fundamentally, if the config has changed, um, then we probably need to start from scratch. Um, so in that scenario, uh, we have us allocating a new hash ring um, because uh, we're assuming that hash ring cannot fail in this scenario. Um, we use the must new constructor there, allocate a new hash ring, and we set the config um, on our, our ring balancer. Um, and then uh, the next conditional below that is another state uh, that we have to handle, which is um, basically uh, we've we've gotten this call, but we actually haven't um, set anything up yet. We haven't gotten the service config with any of the settings, in which case this is kind of like the default state, um, like we haven't been allocated yet. Um, and in that scenario, we're just going to set a picker um, that basically just throws an error. Um, this is kind of the recommended behavior from kind of the different gRPC implementations, and they actually provide this nice library for us uh, base um, that's going to provide a utility function for us, uh, this error picker that's going to return this, this failure for us until we get to a state where we, we can be valid and we can actually start picking good views. Um, so now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. We're actually going to be able to start um, tracking changes to the member set. Um, in this case, we're going to look for um, folks that are not yet added into our member list, so new connections. So um, what we're actually going to do is we're going to iterate over the, the list of addresses that we're going to get out of the resolver state um, that came in when we got our update. And basically, we're going to check to see if this connection exists in a set of connections that we're maintaining ourselves. Um, and if it's not there, then we're, we're going to do kind of some bookkeeping, but fundamentally at the very end, you'll look at the bottom, it has hashroom.add. So we're going to make sure that we add this new connection um, that we weren't tracking before into our hash ring so we can start mapping requests to it. Um, and then uh, the next code block below that is going to be doing the opposite, 
which is uh, removing anything um, that shouldn't be in our hash ring anymore. So what we're going to do is iterate now over our set of connections that uh, we know uh, exist in our hash ring, and we're going to look them up in that, that same set that we just saw. And if it's not in that set, then we need to remove it from our hash ring. Um, so you'll see again at the very bottom, um, we're calling that hash ring remove. Um, there's also a bunch of internal bookkeeping just around uh, normal logic that we have to maintain just being a normal gRPC balancer. But then we get to the end of this function, and we get to call this uh, update state function that's going to do basically both the heavy lifting for us, and that's where we get to actually pro uh, provide uh, the state that we just computed, but also um, the picker. So the picker is really, really important. As I said earlier, the picker is what is going to actually map um, a particular uh, request to one of the members of our hash ring. Um, I'm glad that it's so elegant that it fits very cleanly in this page, uh, the very small function. Fundamentally, we're kind of uh, smuggling this context key in, that is the key for the hash ring um, that gets provided with the request context, um, but then we use that um, to uh, find the members in our hash ring. Um, you'll see that we have this value uh, or this variable called spread, and uh, we're using uh, spread uh, not only in the call to find n, but also a little bit lower. We have this index, um, how we're going to basically ultimately index into the member list to pick the ultimate um, connection that we're going to map over, um, that we're going to send the request over. The uh, idea here is that if you have a replication factor that is greater than one, um, that means that we can actually load balance uh, basically requests across uh, those replications. Um, so this fundamentally means that um, we're going to pick a random node uh, of the set of replications for that have been mapped to. Um, and the um, utility here is not only just like spreading the load across those, but also if you have a failure, if one of these nodes disappears, um, you're going to actually see less disruption because you're not going to have been sending all of that traffic directly to that node. You're going to actually have been spreading that traffic a bunch, a bunch of different replications. Um, so now um, you'll minimize the more disruption if you're kind of spreading across your replication factor. Um, and so then that ultimately is our picker. Um, so that is the core logic behind um, altsaid.com, or sorry, github.com slash altsaid slash consistent, our library um, for implementing all this in JPC. Um, there is a lot more boilerplate, but this is this is the meat and potatoes. Um, fundamentally, um, that's it. Um, honestly, to add this to your code base, it takes about uh, an import of our library. It takes a registering of the, the balancer, um, and it takes setting that initial service config. And, and that's about it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone involved at Altsed who helped um, build this library, um, but also the folks over at gRPC that write all the Go tooling. Um, I think that's also the Golang team and not just the gRPC team. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank the folks that developed the library called Kube Resolver. Kube Resolver is how we actually de um, detect and find that member list. Um, so that space to be can self cluster on Kubernetes. It doesn't need to um, have any configuration from our user. Um, it will actually just auto detect nodes and start um, kind of clustering itself and all of the dispatching and caching that comes for free. Um, if you're interested in implementing anything like that, feel free to jump into our uh, Discord, the SpiceDB Discord. This is not just for folks that are trying to solve authorization problems, but folks interested in distributed systems or um, kind of com uh, building uh, orthogonal tooling in the cloud native ecosystem. Um, also, if you're interested in kind of other distributed systems topics, I've also given a previous webinar talking about database consistency and consistency in general um, that you can find with this YouTube link here. Uh, thanks for listening.